Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of Allah, most gracious, ever merciful. Assalamu alaikum. Peace and blessings of Allah be upon you, dear viewers. Welcome to tonight's lecture organized by UK Talim Department. As per our tradition, we will start the program with a recitation of the Holy Quran. Can I request Shafur Rahman Sahib to deliver the Talawat and its English translation, please? Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. A'uzu billahi min ash-shaytanir rajim. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Walain asabakum fadlum min Allahi la yakulan nakallam takum bainakum bainakum wa bainahu mawad. Tatuya laytani kuntu ma'ahum Fafuza fawzan azima Falyukatil fi sabilillahi Al-lazina yashruna al-hayatat Dunya bil akhira wa may yuqatil fi sabilillahi fa yuqtal aw yaghlib fa sawfa nu'tihi ajran azima I have just recited verses 74 to 75 of chapter 4, Al-Nisa. The English translation of the verses is as follows. I seek refuge with Allah from Satan the accursed. In the name of Allah, the gracious, the merciful. But if there comes to you some good fortune from Allah, he says, as if there were no love between you and him, would that I had been with them, then should I have indeed achieved a great success. Let those then fight in the cause of Allah, who would sell the present life for the hereafter, and whose fight in the cause of Allah, be he slain or be he victorious. We shall soon give him a great reward. Jazakallah. Jazakallah. Tonight we have the pleasure of um, being joined by Dr. Irfan Malik Sahib, uh, who's a serving as a Nazmiala in East Midland. And as a profession, he's a general practitioner. As always, there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions. And these will be put to our guests on your behalf towards the end of the program. Uh, please type your questions in the live chat and kindly remember to keep it to the relevant to nice topic. It gives me great pleasure to hand over to Dr. Irfan Malik Sahib to deliver the lecture for tonight's lecture. Thank you so much for inviting me this evening. I'm just going to share my slides. Are the slides visible, Shaquille Saab? Um, I think they will come in a little while. They are not yet. Uh, yes, they are now. So I'm just going. No, uh, not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Not Let yet. me just go and press. Um... Still not there? No, I'm afraid not. Not yet. Okay. Am I doing something wrong here? So if you click the share and you did the follow the same thing as we did before, am I correct? 
Yes, let's try again. Oh, the, the, it, it's, it's appearing now. So I think you have to click on your file now. Yeah. Brilliant. Have we got it? Yeah, we are on. Jazakallah. Thank you so much. Um, this evening I'm speaking about uh, the Muslim contribution in the First World War. Um, and I will give a, a personal perspective uh, on this topic. Um, I'm not a teacher and I'm not a historian either. So uh, I've, I've done this uh, as a hobby. So please bear with me. So I will start off by introducing a small village um, called Dulmial in Punjab, present day Pakistan. Um, this village is about uh, 100 miles south of Islamabad. And this is the uh, my ancestral village. So my father, grandfather, great grandfathers all descend from Dulmial. Uh, the nearest town is Chakwal. Um, it's based in the Salt Range in Punjab. Like I said, it's my uh, ancestral village. Uh, the main uh, people living there are the Malik Awans, uh, which was part of the martial races, also known as the Punjabi Muslims. Um, looking back at history, we have references to this area going back to 630 AD when Chinese pilgrim uh, Haisen Xiang uh, visited the area and described the people as being courageous and warlike. Uh, he was there visiting the nearby Kitas Raj Buddhist temples. Um, and we have evidence in the form of letters from the vi village that um, the soldiers from this village supported the British army going back to the time of the Indian mutiny in 1857. So what's special about Dulmial? Um, in World War I, it provided 460 men, which was a record for any South Asian village. Um, and out of those 460, more than 100 were Viceroy commissioned officers. In the Second World War, there were more than 800 men. And later after partition, there was a large contribution to the Pakistan army and also in the Indian army from descendants of this village. And in 1925, Dulmial was awarded a cannon uh, by the British government in recognition of these services. Uh, and my project started in 2014 um, after having a discussion with a patient. Um, he was a, a researcher in World War I looking at the Commonwealth contribution. And I said, well, you'll be interested to hear about our cannon in our village in Pakistan. And that's how this uh, project started. I mentioned Kitas Raj temples. This is a photograph of them with the central lake. They go back you know, centuries going back to Buddhist times. And this is a, another beautiful views of the, of the temples, which are very close by uh, to Dulmial village. Also close by are the historic Kura salt mines. Um, and this is where um, what we know as Himalayan rock salts comes from. Uh, it's the second largest salt mine in the world. Um, and inside the, it, the mines go for miles and miles and you can see these beautiful structures there that are made, the tunnels, the lamps, uh, and on the top left, a, a mosque built in this translucent uh, red salt. So looking at the First World War and undivided India, they, the region provided up to 1.5 million soldiers 11 of them received Victoria Crosses and 13,000 medals for gallantry were issued to these troops. There were 400,000 Muslim soldiers, 124,000 Sikhs and 680,000 Hindus. 75,000 Indians died, 9,000 of them on the Western Front, so in France and Belgium. As well as manpower, there were up to 180,000 animals, so horses, mules, goats that came over from India, and nearly 4 million tons of supplies. 
As well as that, there was a huge financial cost to the region, which in today's money would add up to about 19 billion pounds. So Undivided India gave an enormous amount um, in the Great War. And troops from Undivided India took uh, part in battle in all theaters of, of war, you know, wherever they were needed in the Western Front, in Africa, in Egypt, Balkans, and also back in Asia as well. And here we have a, a marble plaque in the village of Dulmial, and I'll read it. From this village, 460 men went to the Great War, 1914 to 1919. Of these, nine gave their lives. And the people, the soldiers that passed away, we have records from the, of them as well, uh, who originated from Dulmial. Um, so Sattar Muhammad is remembered in uh, Dars es Salaam War Cemetery, where he, he passed away. Uh, Fateh Muhammad in Tehran. Uh, three soldiers are remembered at the Delhi Memorial at India Gate. Two soldiers in Basra Memorial. And then one, Lance Naik Ismail Khan, he was with the 33rd Punjab Regiment, and he passed away at the Battle of Luz in 1915 and is remembered uh, at the Neuve Chapelle Memorial. This is a photograph of the veterans of World War I from Dulmial, and they're pictured in 1925 when the cannon uh, arrived at the village. Um, and in this photo, I was lucky enough to have two great grandfathers uh, in this photo. So Subadar Muhammad Khan and also Captain Hulam Muhammad. So you can see they're very proud displaying their medals. This is a photo of a typical uh, Punjabi Muslim soldier of the time. So this gentleman is with the uh, 82nd Punjab Regiment. Um, and from his turban, we can see that it's a Muslim style turban with the kulla. Um, and then the pagri wrapped round. Um, so the, a very common question that I uh, that I get at talks is that it was the Sikhs who were wearing the turbans, but uh, it was also the Hindus and Muslims as well. Um, and the Punjabi Muslims were described as the backbone of the British Indian Army uh, by Major Gordon Corrigan, who was uh, uh, an ex-soldier and uh, historian as well. And here we, we have an interesting photograph of a lot of different types of turbans. Again, Muslims, Hindus, Sikhs, all wore turbans, but having a certain different style depending on where they originated from. And this is a typical tunic that an Indian soldier would wear. I was fortunate enough um, to receive the records for each and every soldier from Dulmial village in World War I. Um, the records were kept in the Lahore Museum archives uh, and were recently um, published by the UK Punjab Heritage Association. And they kindly shared um, all this data with me, which was very useful for my research because from this we could find out where most of our soldiers from this particular village ended up. It was a predominantly Muslim village, but as you can see, they're mostly with the different types, different numbers of Punjab regiments, uh, also with the 27 cavalry, and some in camel corps, labor corps, and sappers and miners as well. So we were very fortunate to have these detailed records. This just gives um, a, the ranks of the Indian soldiers and the British ones. So a Sipai would be equivalent to a private, a Naik, Corporal, Havildar was a sergeant, Jemadar, Lieutenant, Subedar, Captain, Subedar Major being a major. But the most senior ranked Indian officer was always subordinate to the most junior British officer. And this was just, uh, you know, how it was during that time. 
This is a memorial plaque close to our village in a place called Kalarkar in the Salt Range, and I will read it in memory of the 3,000 fighting men who came down this gorge to battle in the Great War, 1914, 1918, and more especially of those who never returned. This better way was made by the Punjab government. So you can see from this that how many thousands of people uh, men, uh, you know, volunteered for the Great War from this region of Punjab. And this is a photograph of the cannon that sits in the center of Dolmial village, uh, which is a type of war memorial. The cannon, like I said previously, was presented to Dulmial in uh, 1925. It's a 12-pounder Bloomfield design weighing 1.7 tons. It's an ex-British uh, naval cannon. And it originates from Caron Ironworks in Falkirk in Scotland, uh, being made in 1816, more than 200 years old and still in very good condition. Um, and it was transported by train from the 1st Punjab Regiment in Jhelum to Chakwal. And then from Chakwal to village, uh, Dulmial village, it was 40 kilometers and it was bought by oxen cart. Um, and they had to change the oxen carts halfway through because it was so heavy. But finally, it made it to the village. Um, this is a photograph um, on the on the left uh, is a picture of my father in the in the center when he was young, and also my uncles as well posing with the uh, gun in Dulmial in 1939. And on the bottom right, my father went back in 2017 uh, to visit uh, you know his his village where he grew up and was born. So the difference between these two photographs is uh, 80 years. Next village to Dulmial, um, there was a mission high school in Dalwal, which uh, was established in 1900. It was um, run by Belgian Capuchin Christian monks. Uh, and you can see a picture there of the principal, Father Sylvester. Um, so we were very fortunate um, in this village that the boys and girls going there were educated and could speak English uh, and learn to, to read and write as well. Uh, because in Punjab at that time, this was uh, quite a rare phenomenon to have, a, have such a good school there. And this later on helped um, in the British Indian Army. That's another view of the cannon raised on a on a marble uh, base there in the early days the cannon was known as the birdwood gun uh, because field marshal lord william birdwood uh, who was a uh, commander-in-chief of british india visited um, the gun uh, twice and saluted at that point and he was um, the officer in charge who allowed dulmial to have to receive this as a reward um, and a few years ago, I met his uh, great uh, nephew, uh, Colonel Gordon Birdwood in London, and we compared notes about how our ancestors could have, could have known each other. This is another view of the cannon. Moving on to the uh, memorial stone just at the back of the cannon, our heritage. This gun was awarded to Dulmial in recognition of services rendered by all ranks from this village during and prior to the First Great War, 1914 to 1919. The gun was brought uh, from Jhelum and placed here under the supervision of Honorary Captain Malik Ghulam Muhammad and other veterans in 1925. So a great honor for the village. Um, and that's the um, motto of the Royal Artillery um, on the memorial plaque as well. So another view of the cannon across the central lake. So anybody traveling in and out of the village will be able to see the, the, the cannon, which is a type of war memorial. Um, and this is our mosque, the Ahmadiyya Muslim Mosque in Dulmial which is uh, a beautiful setting really in the foothills there of the Himalayas. Um, unfortunately, uh, in 2016, uh, our mosque was attacked by uh, extremists uh, from around the area and is still unfortunately sealed. This is another view of the cannon, which is quite a focal point uh, for children. 
this is the base um, of the canon, uh, and A. Broom refers to Captain Arthur Broom uh, of the Kosipa Gun Foundry in Calcutta, and that stand dates back to 1847. Um, that's the serial number on the cannon from Karen Ironworks in 1816. Um, and that's a picture of my previous visits to the cannon a long time ago when my children were younger. This is a photograph of the veterans, World War I, uh, taken in the 1920s. Uh, my great grandfather, um, Subadar. Uh, Muhammad Khan is is in the picture and also the central figure with the darker uniform with lots of medals is Captain Ghulam Muhammad and he was the most decorated soldier in the village and when the British came to Dhulmial and asked him what reward Dhulmial would like um, he said he, a, a cannon because he was a lifelong gunner an artillery man and he didn't want any you know any other financial rewards or any other uh, thing for the village apart from this cannon. That's another picture of, of the veterans. Uh, you can just see part of the cannon there. So very, very proud traditions uh, dating back many years in the village. This is a portrait of my great grandfather, Subadar Mohammed Khan, uh, which now hangs in, in Canada. So talking about my uh, great grandfather, Subedar Muhammad Khan, he was with the 33rd Punjab Regiment. He joined the army in 1891 and retired in 1918. Uh, he received an Indian General Service Medal for Tushi campaign, uh, one clasp for Frontier uh, Punjab in 1897-98. Uh, uh, he had qualifications for musketry and transport duties, and he was fortunate enough um, to be chosen as one of the Indian soldiers um, who visited London in 1911 uh, to be present for the King George V coronation. Uh, he was also uh, present at the Delhi Darbar in 1911 as well. And he was one of the first people in, in our family uh, to take bet and convert to becoming an MD Muslim, uh, Muslim. Uh, and it was actually my great-grandmother who, who first converted. This is another picture of his regiment, the 33rd Punjab Regiment, um, and as you can see there are British officers there, there are Hindus, Sikhs, Muslims, um, you know, all together in this um, regiment, uh, you know, fighting for a common cause. Um, so I use this photo a lot in uh, interfaith talks um, that all religions, uh, you know, stood side by side at that time. This is a message from King George V uh, to the departing Indian troops going to the Western Front in August 1914. And I will read this. Officers, non-commissioned officers and men, I look to all my Indian soldiers to uphold the Izzat honor of the British Raj against the aggressive and relentless enemy. I know with what readiness my loyal and brave Indian soldiers are prepared to fulfill this sacred thrust on the field of battle, shoulder to shoulder with their comrades from all parts of the empire. Rest assured that you will always be in my thoughts and prayers. I bid you go forward to add fresh luster to the glorious achievements and noble traditions, courage and chivalry of my Indian army, whose honor and fame are in your hands. So a great uh, endorsement from the King Emperor. And here is a picture of the King Emperor himself, Colonel-in-Chief King George the, the V, um, here dressed in military uniform, which is not unusual. Uh, but if you look at his headgear, it is a turban. And with the kulla there, it is a Muslim-style um, turban. So reaching out to India and reaching out to Muslims as well. Um, so in, nine, uh, in 2014, um, the, 
the Foreign and Commonwealth Office uh, sent out a press release as they were marking the centenary of the Great War. And they mentioned Dulmial and the 460 soldiers in this press release as well. So this gave us enormous media coverage. Uh, they were unveiling a plaque uh, remembering the three Victoria Cross recipients of present day Pakistan, um, Sipai Khudadad Khan, Jamadar Mead Dust, and Naik Shah Ahmed Khan. And I will talk about a little bit about these later on as well. On doing further research of uh, Dulmial village, um, looking back, there was an article um, in Dundee in the Evening Telegraph and Post dating back to 1914, uh, titled The Cradle of Soldiers. And this article describes a British captain going to Dulmial and recruiting uh, young soldiers because there were so many uh, youngsters in the village and retired officers who trained them as well. Um, so this was a, a source of soldiers for the British Indian Army. And the recruits actually had to pay £30, which was the equivalent of three years net pay um, to join the army. But that wasn't an issue for them because that's what they wanted to do. We've also um, got a reference in the war speeches of Sir Michael O'Dwyer, dating back to 1917. Moving on, um, you know, the small village of Dulmial, you know, we have um, uh, references in a number of texts, and this book is the, the Punjab and the war, and um, it mentions distinguished villages um, that were granted memorial marble plaques, and Dulmial being one of them, having sent a record 460 men in the Great War. And that's the plaque that this book refers to that I showed previously as well. It's in a primary school in the village displayed on an on a obelisk and very well preserved and actually these memorials um marble memorial stones are uh, present throughout the indian subcontinent in prominent villages and prominent places so i have quite a, a collection of these building up now also in 1934, Dulmial has a uh, reference in this book called The Wisdom and Waste in the Punjab Village, it refers to, again to the 460 troops, um, and there were only 879 males in the village at that time, including young boys and elderly as well. Um, so a majority of them, the, the fit and well men, joined the army. We've also got another reference in the history of the Indian Mountain Artillery in 1957. In this book, uh, the references to Captain Ulam Muhammad, who was the most uh, senior decorated officer from the village. Recently, uh, we've, we've discovered uh, Captain Ulam Muhammad's uh, uniform. Um, his medals are preserved in Islamabad in Pakistan. And that's a picture of Captain Ulam Muhammad and his family there. Again, very proud of his uh, heritage. And that's Captain Ula Muhammad uh, on his horse posing with the, with the Dulmial cannon. Coming more recently to 2015, uh, Dulmial also has a reference in this textbook uh, for King and Another Country, Indian Soldiers on the Western Front, written by Shibrani Basu. We've also published in the Durma, Durbar uh, Journal of Indian Military Historical Society. 2018, in the book, uh, The Indian Empire at War, uh, authored by George Morton Jack. Again, we have a, a reference to Dulmial village and, and the veterans. And more recently this year, uh, this book, We Are the Legion, uh, the British, uh, the Royal British Legion at 100, uh, authored by Julia Summers. Um, and again, the history of Dulmial is uh, documented with pictures in this book. We've had a multitude of blogs and publications, um, you know, all over the place in newspaper, online, and in journals over the last few years to highlight the history. Um, we don't often hear a lot about the women during the war, but we have letters, um, a correspondence between a widow of an officer, Mrs. Bell, um, and the, the 
Punjabi women from Dulmial as well. So we've got publications around these letters as well. I'm just going to take a short break there while you admire this picture of uh, cricket in Chatral. Thank you. Right, so um, now I'm going to mention an iconic figure, uh, Subadar Khudadat Khan. Uh, he was a Rajput clan. He was from Dub village in Jaqual. And he had the honor of being the first Indian and first Muslim Victoria Cross recipient. Uh, he was a Sipai in the 129th uh, Baloch Regiment. And his act of bravery was at the first Battle of Ypres in Belgium uh, in 1914. Uh, all around him were injured and later died. He was left manning a machine gun by himself. Uh, and he held that position against the Germans for as long as possible before reinforcements came. And for that, he was awarded the Victoria Cross. So we can see, see a sketch of how he was at that time. He is remembered in the Pakistan Army Museum in Ravalpindi with this beautiful bronze statue. And his village has this sign, the first Muslim recipient of the Victoria Cross. So an icon iconic figure. The second Victoria Cross recipient was Subadar Mir Dust from the Afridi clan. He was from Tira Valley in northwest frontier Pakistan. He was a Jemadar with the 55 Cokes rifles. And his act of bravery was in the second Battle of Ypres uh, in Belgium in 1915. Uh, he was injured by chlorine gas. There were no masks at that time for him. Um, and yet he held his position and helped to bring back uh, certain injured soldiers as, as well. Here is a, a photo of Lord Kitchener meeting Mir Dust uh, at the Royal Pavilion in Brighton in 1915. And in Brighton, there is a, a blue uh, plaque um, in his honor as well. He was fortunate enough um, to receive his Victoria Cross from uh, King George V in 1915, personally. The third Victoria Cross recipient from present-day Pakistan is uh, Subadar Shah Ahmed Khan. Uh, he was a Rajput from Takhti village in Rawalpindi. He was a Nike with the 89th Punjab Regiment, um, and his act of bravery took place in 1916 in Mesopotamia. Again, he was a gunner and held his position um, for rescuing injured colleagues at the same time. And that's a picture of him uh, posing with a vicar's gun. So this, in 1914, it hit the headlines, um, and we can see some examples here um, that uh, 70,000 Indian soldiers to fight for the empire, princes going to the front. Um, so this was, uh, you know, first time in history that uh, Indian troops had come to Europe to, to help the Allies. So it, it made waves at that time. And this is the type of camps that they were in, in Marseille. And the Indian soldiers were very respected and welcomed. And here we can see a picture from 1914. It's the 3rd Lahore Division, infantry soldiers arriving in Marseille. Um, so you can see the Indian soldiers there. They have Muslim style turbans there. Uh, one gentleman meeting a young French boy there. And it was only a few weeks after this that they were thrust forward onto the front line, into the trenches in very cold, wet, muddy weather. And they didn't have, um, you know, suitable clothing and uniform until much later. And this is how they were transported to the front, uh, to the trenches in double-decker buses. And you can see at the top, um, there are soldiers, Indian soldiers in turbans being transported to the front line. This is a picture again in, in Belgium on the Western front of the 129th Baloch Regiment. You can see these are a group of Muslim soldiers there with their Lee Enfield rifles. Um, and second from, from the left at the top, there's a British officer as well, also uh, posing in a turban. 
And this is what it was like in the trenches. Um, so this was before gas masks. They just had primitive gas hoods. Uh, but you can see the Indian soldiers there wearing turbans as well as their gas hoods. This is the nine Hodgson horses, Bengal lancers, part of the British Indian Army, uh, at, the, at the Battle of Somme in France in 1917. So looking at troops that served um, Britain and the Allies, we've mentioned the 1.5 million from India, which was the largest contribution, but also from Australia and New Zealand, South Africa, Ireland, Canada, West Indies, and other dominions as well. So over the last six, seven years, we've been trying to raise awareness of the wider contribution in the Great War. And focusing on this slide here, um, specifically looking at the Muslim contribution, overall there were 4 million Muslims uh, as uh, supporting the Allies in the Great War. We know that from the Indian subcontinent, 400,000 were Muslims. Uh, but then you've also got Muslims from uh, the Arab states and North Africa as well, Algeria, Morocco, Tunisia. So that number 280,000. Then we had 100,000 from West Africa, 130,000 from uh, other North Africans, uh, 200,000 Sub-Saharans, 5,000 Somalians, Libyans, 130,000 Egyptians, even 5,000 Muslims from America, and 1.3 million uh, Muslims from Russia, also Muslims from Cyprus and China as well, all coming together. And on the opposite side were, were 500,000 Ottomans um, and 10,000 Muslim Africans on the side of the Germans as well. So you can see the, the, the huge numbers from across, across the world that uh, contributed. This is a picture of David Lloyd George, who was Secretary of State at that time and later uh, Prime Minister. Uh, visiting the Indian troops on the Western Front in 1916. So the Indian troops were very appreciated for what they did. Here we have a photo from uh, 1918 at the Second Battle of Marn. In the front we can see the Indian troops and behind them we can see the black uh, Senegalese troops. Um, so you can see from this picture that people from, you know, different continents, Africa, Asia, all coming together for a common cause. The injured um, Indian soldiers were brought back to the Brighton Pavilion, uh, which was a military hospital between 1914 and uh, 1916. And you can see the Indian troops uh, recuperating in this photograph. Um, and here there's a beautiful colorized photo of the inside of the Royal Pavilion in Brighton, uh, which treated over 4,000 Indian patients um, injured on, on the Western Front. They were very well, well looked after here, and there were 32 deaths. In Brighton, um, uh, because the diet for Muslims and Hindus and Sikhs was different, they had different slaughterhouses and different kitchens as well. So here we have uh, the Muslim meat house on the left and then the Hindu one on the right. So the British were careful to accommodate uh, religious um, and cultural differences. This is another place in Bournemouth, um, the Mont Doré Hotel, which was also used for recovering injured Indian troops. This is a place called Barton on Sea uh, by the coast in Hampshire. And this memorial sits there dating back to 1914. Again, remembering the local Indian troops who were in a building nearby uh, recovering from their injuries uh, from the war. This is a Commonwealth Memorial Gate and Pavilion uh, at Constitution Hill in central London, just behind Buckingham Palace. Um, it was inaugurated in 2002, and it remembers the 5 million Commonwealth soldiers uh, which served in both world wars. And on the pillars, we can see uh, inscriptions for India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Nepal, Africa, the, and the Caribbean. So we were, we were all in it together. 
on the top of the ceiling of the pavilion, they are inscribed there the names of the 23 Victoria Cross recipients of World War I and also the George Cross uh, and Victoria Cross recipients of World War II as well. I'll just touch on uh, the Woking Shah Jahan Mosque, um, which was the old, oldest purpose-built mosque uh, in Britain, dating back to 1889. Um, and it's... Um, uh, iconic because the soldiers congregated there and here you can see a picture in the Woking Mosque of Eid prayers in uh, 1916 and you can see there that the Indi there are predominantly Indian soldiers there that are praying but in the background we can see English uh, ladies and men there so it was a, a wonderful uh, interfaith event really a really uh, lifted community spirit Nearby to Woking, we have the Muslim burial ground, um, which was redeveloped in 2015. This is where 19 soldiers, Muslim soldiers, were buried after World War I and eight from World War II. In the 60s, they were moved over to the Brookwood Cemetery nearby. Um, and this is now a beautiful peace garden. So it's well worth a, a visit um, near to Woking, uh, Horshall Woods, Horshall Common. Um, and it's tucked away uh, off the roadside in the woods there, but a very wonderful spiritual place. This is a picture of uh, World War I soldiers in Mesopotamia. And you can see that prayer, salat, is very important even in war. And you can see that here we have a, a mud mosque, temporary mosque built there um, that the soldiers uh, prayed in. So, so faith was important. This is the half moon uh, prisoner of war camp in Zosan near Berlin in Germany. Um, and the Indian Muslim troops were kept here. And you can see that there is a mosque there as well. Um, so even Germany respected um, the religious identity of their prisoners. This is the Chattery Memorial in Brighton, um, which was uh, built, inaugurated in 1921 to the memory of all the Indian soldiers who gave their lives for the King Emperor in the Great War. This monument erected on the site of the funeral pyre where the 53 Hindu and Sikhs who died in hospital in Brighton passed through the fire is in grateful admiration and brotherly affection dedicated. Um, so this is where um, the Hindu and Sikh soldiers were cremated on the top um, of this hill. So again, it's a beautiful area to visit. This is a photograph of uh, Hazrat Mirza Bashiruddin Mahmoud Ahmed. Uh, may Allah be pleased with him, uh, Khalif Masih II. Uh, in 1924, he visited the UK um, and he made a special visit to this Chattery Memorial in Brighton and prayed at this site. There's also a, a Indian memorial at Neuve Chapelle in France, remembering uh, the 4,700 World War I Indian soldiers without a grave. And the inscription there says, God is one, his is the victory. Another Indian memorial at Memmingate, Ypres in Belgium. This is on the Western Front. Um, so you can see Christian graves here and next to it, we can see Muslim headstones as well. So it, did, it didn't matter. These were brothers in war and they shared their graveyards and shared their lives as well together uh, for a common cause. The India Gate, remembering World War I soldiers at the memorial in Delhi. In Verdun, in France, there's a special um, Muslim memorial there, remembering the Muslim soldiers that died for France. In the Royal Military Academy at Sandhurst, there's a special room dedicated to the Indian Army Memorial Room um, with st uh, stained glass windows um, highlighting the campaigns of the Indian soldiers. Moving on to Poppy Appeal, uh, again, all religion, all faiths are represented in Poppy Appeal. 
um, and the Ahmadiyya Muslim Elders Association, the Ansars, each year um, they are very active in fundraising for the British Poppy Appeal and that's also attending remembrance functions as, as well. Um, and this project, you know, has highlighted that, uh, you know, why we have to remember the fallen because we were there too. We have a lot of strong shared history that we should take part in remembrance functions and Poppy Appeals as well. Uh, with my project, uh, you know, in 2018, um, I was lucky enough to be invited to the Festival of Remembrance um, and was remembering my great grandfather on the stage at the Royal Albert Hall um, and also was invited to the National Service of Thanksgiving at Westminster Abbey. So that was a centenary of the end of the Great War. So it was a great honor for me. Um, and my work, um, you know, has attracted mainstream media attention as well. So Sky News, BBC, even the Daily Telegraph as well. Um, so it was just important to get the message that uh, Undivided India was there too as well in the world wars. Um, so this card, I will just read, um, our Indian warriors staunch and true have proved their worth to all to guard the flag they dare it and do at England's battle call. Um, so I'm just gonna end on one other uh, aspect. Um, so how the Great War relates to Ahmadiyya Muslims. Um, and I'll just uh, highlight the Review of Religions, which was a special edition in August uh, 2018. Um, and it was the centenary um, of the fulfillment of the Great Warning. So our promised Messiah, uh, Hazrat, um, uh, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, uh, salam, peace be upon him, um, prophesied um, the Great War. And if I have a few more minutes, I will quickly read uh, this, this prophecy, which is in the form of a poem. A sign will appear sometime from now. Today is the 15th of April, 1905, which shall overwhelm villages, towns and meadows. The wrath of God will bring a revolution in the world. The naked one will have no time to fasten his trousers. Suddenly a calamity will severely shake them all, be they human, trees, rocks, or oceans. In the twinkling of an eye, the land will be turned upside down and streams of blood will flow like the river, water of a rivulet. Those whose night garments were white as jasmine will be in the morning as if clad in red, like the sycamore tree. Men shall lose their senses and birds their consciousness and nightingales and pigeons will forget their songs. That hour will bear heavily upon every traveler and wayfarers will lose their way in confusion and deliriousness with the blood of the dead and the running waters of the highland streams will turn red like bistort syrup. The terror of it will exhaust everyone great and small, and even the czar at the hour will be in a pitiable state. That divine sign will be a specimen of terror. The sky will attack with a drawn sword. Hasten not to repudiate this, thou discerning fool, for my truthfulness depends entirely on the fulfillment of this sign. This is a prophecy based on divine revelation and will surely be fulfilled. Wait then a while in righteousness and steadfastness. Jazakallah, thank you, I'll, I'll end there. Jazakallah, um, Jazakallah, Dr. Malik Saib, for such a comprehensive lecture, I mean, full of historical facts. Uh, no doubt our viewers must have uh, really um, enjoyed this. I mean, it reflects the great contribution of Muslims. Um, and the facts, for me personally, the facts of the turban were very fascinating for me, that how you presented that. And uh, your presentation of the photos were quite admirable. So there's no doubt, I'm sure, um, the viewers have, would have been benefited. Um, well, thank you, viewers, for watching our online lecture. Uh, please don't forget that uh, we have Urdu lecture next week on Monday and English lecture, English lecture on Tuesday as a usual time at 8 p.m. Um, if you have any suggestions 
or any comments, please do not forget to um, email us or on our um, the email address, which is I'll put that on the screen for those of you. Um, uh, it'll come up on there, which is talim online at ahmdiauk.org. Uh, Any feedback would be really beneficial. Um, at this stage, can I request um, uh, Malik Saib to Dr. Malik Saib to, to lead us in the silent prayers, please? Uh, please join me in uh, silent prayers. Dua karle. Amin. Amin. Zakala. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum assalam.